Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sarah Hobson. I am co-owner of Hobson and Hobson PC. We are a divorce and custody and criminal defense firm. And this is my husband and business partner and partner in life, Christopher Hobson. And if you would just take a moment to introduce yourself to our viewers. Sure. I'm uh, Chris Hobson. As she said, I'm one of the owners of Hobson and Hobson. And we protect parental rights and fight for financial futures. And today I'm going to be interviewing Chris about a um, topic that comes up a lot in divorce and custody cases, and that is infidelity. And um, we want to, first of all, let you guys know none of this is intended to be legal advice. Um, this is just, we're expressing our own views and opinions. Um, if you would like legal advice, you would need to either call us to have a consultation or a strategy session with an attorney. Um, this is just our opinions, not intended to be legal advice, and things could be different in your own particular situation than the uh, events and experiences that we're talking about here on Facebook. Um, also, we just wanted to talk about infidelity in relation to a divorce and custody case. A lot of people have questions about it. Um, sometimes people will come to us with the impression that um, if there has been infidelity or they suspect that there's been infidelity, then um, they, they think, well, maybe that means that I get to keep the whole house and, and all the cars. And um, we just want to talk about our opinions about infidelity. And I thought it would be fun to interview my husband on this topic. So first of all, um, can you describe to the viewers, like define what infidelity means? Infidelity in, in, is... In the context of a divorce or custody case. Sure. As far as the statute goes, so basically, in a nutshell, there's a, a fault-based and a non-fault-based grounds for divorce. And I won't get into the particulars of that, but one of the fault-based grounds for divorce is that uh, the opposing party or your husband or your wife had uh, an affair uh, that led to the divorce, that caused the divorce. In order for it to be adultery as defined by the statute. It had to have been the act of adultery that caused the divorce. So to go a step further in what does the law define, how do you define adultery per the statute? Essentially, you have to prove that um, a sexual relationship occurred um, that, again, caused the divorce and caused the separation of the parties. So people say, a lot of times ask, and they say, well, wow, um, how do I prove that? Well, you don't actually have to prove that the affair 100% happened, you can prove it most generally by circumstantial evidence, by hiring a private investigator to look into um, where your spouse is at, uh, why are they leaving every night, why are they saying that they're uh, working late when you know that they're not, and they come home and they look like they've been at a restaurant. So you can prove that they're doing these things um, to show by, um, by the standard of evidence that an affair occurred that caused the divorce. Okay, so let me back you up a little bit. Sure. Um, when we're talking about infidelity, um, and you said it, it would have to be, you know, for a fault-based divorce, it would have to be the, the, the cause of the divorce. In what instances would infidelity not be considered to be, and also let me preface this with, we're in Georgia, so we're, we're, we're expressing our views and opinions and interpretations of the Georgia statutes. Um, if you're in another state, you would need to contact an attorney in your own state. Um, but when we're talking about infidelity, what, what are some instances of like where it's not somehow, you know, there's there's an act of infidelity in, in the marriage. Let's just say that that's not debatable. When would it what instances have you seen where it was not the cause of the divorce or the or the or the court ruled that it was not the cause of the divorce? Sure. So a lot of times um, reconciliation is the biggest thing. So a lot of times people will come into our office and they'll say, well, an affair happened, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, a year ago, whatever it may be. And um, did it cause harm to the marriage? Of course. Um, did it cause mistrust and difficulties that led to a possible divorce in the future, which is why they came to our office? Absolutely. But the law requires that it be that the affair occurred and then the, that is why the divorce happened. That's why the parties separated. So for instance, if the parties, if the affair occurs, someone admits to the affair and they work through it, they go to counseling, um, they reconcile, they have sexual relations again, uh, a number of different factors, then the court would rule that no, that wasn't the cause of the divorce because you reconciled. You're no longer the divorce or excuse me, the affair took place too long ago and too many things happened in the meantime. Um, that it was not the cause of the divorce. So it wasn't the gr fault-based grounds for divorce. So let's say um, 
John and Jane are married and they have two children and John um, had an affair and Jane knew about it. And although Jane is quite upset, she still desi decides to have intercourse with them. She's not happy about it. She's upset about it. She's thinking about having a divorce or fi filing for divorce. She's met with an attorney, but even though she's not with an attorney, she just had a weak moment and she had intercourse with him. What effect would that have on, in your opinion, on um, the ability to claim that infidelity was the, the cause of the divorce? Well, that's a very <laughs> fact specific uh, question. Uh, well, I would first have to ask you, like, why would Jane want uh, the court to find that the divorce caused the marriage? Um, and that, well, that's a whole other question that we can get into later. But uh, as far as her having a one-time reconciliation act, um, that would be up to the judge. In, in fact, all of it is facts. It's all a fact-based ground. So the judge would have to determine and use their discretion to determine was that a moment of weakness? Uh, was it really an act of reconciliation? Of course, John would likely argue that it 100% was. Uh, Jane would argue that it wasn't, that it was um, maybe she had too much wine that night. Maybe, there's a number of different factors. It was a moment of weakness. He took her out to a restaurant. Uh, maybe she can prove that that was all part of his plan. Maybe she can prove that he already hired an attorney and the attorney instructed him to do it. So uh, there's a number of different situations uh, that could really come into play to determine whether or not that is something that would come out in court as to why it would be a um, cause of divorce. But generally, if, if you're looking at one time, um, that causes a big dispute because both sides would have arguments to that, and it would really be up to the judge. So as opposed to several acts of reconciliation, um, this, that, this instance, this um, hypothetical that I've given you would be more of a close call. Yeah, I mean, so generally, if there's reconciliation, it's it's – it's over the years. I mean, you don't, what you would be describing is if he had an, if John had an affair, they started the divorce and then Jane had a moment of weakness, maybe during the divorce action and had, and they reconciled or they, they tried to so, get a therapy. So after, let's just clarify. So after a divorce has been filed, um, and, and we've seen this, I mean, this, this happens after divorce has been filed. If there is a, an act of reconciliation, um, what effect does that have on the ability for the for the divorce to go forward? Well, the, if there's reconciliation, meaning specifically intercourse, um, then the, the court uh, could ultimately dismiss the whole divorce action and say that reconciliation has occurred. But the, but also, I've seen where parties stipulate that there was no reconciliation and they request that the court proceed so that they don't waste the time and money. That's happened to them. Because the effect of that would be essentially they'd have to refile, start all over, pay, you know, would they have and, to. And everyone would just end up losing the money that they've already spent. So it's not generally worth the time unless they do, in fact, reconcile. And then most of the time the lawyers dismiss it and they go back to their um, their lives. Those are some of the best times is when your client calls you and says, hey, we're going to work things out. Those are my favorite phone calls. And um, what about if Jane did not know about the if, if Jane did not know that John had had an affair, what, I mean, if, if she has no knowledge of the affair and she's still having intercourse with her husband, then what would, what would that outcome be? She has to be on notice. So, uh, so in your example, if she learns later that he had an affair, then none of that would be reconciliation because she was never on notice that an affair was occurring. She, it starts from the day that she learns about it. And then if reconciliation happens after that, then obviously, um, then that would cause issues if you wanted to bring the fault race grounds based on a, a affair. But no, if she just had no clue and they were just going about their daily lives and they were happily, well, supposedly happily married and then learned about it. No, none of that. It would only start after the time clock doesn't start until after she has notice of it. So what about a suspicion? Like what if, um, let's say, let's say John has a suspicion that Jane is not being faithful to their marriage. Um, does that rise to the level of being on notice of, of infidelity? No, I would argue that does not uh, give rise to it. I mean, I, I, again, it's a fact-based thing that's ultimately up to the judge. I would say if you had suspicions, you one, you need to speak to counsel. Uh, you need to find out what you can do to put yourself in the best position um, uh, during the divorce. And, and, and I want to, just on a side note, while we're talking about that, a lot of people um, – if you have a suspicion, it's obviously best to go ahead and proceed and talk to counsel, in my opinion, because you can set yourself up 
for success in the divorce. A lot of people, I know divorce is a very difficult topic. Not a lot of people want to talk a lot. Of, I, like, I understand people don't want to go through it. But if you suspect there's an affair, generally there is. Okay, I haven't had too many instances. Actually, I've never had an instance where someone expected an affair, came into my office, we hired a private investigator and had to give them their money back and say, nope, no affair. No, I mean, if, if they're suspecting it, there's reason to be. Um, so you, you want to do things and you want to prepare your case. Most people that go through a divorce process wait until it's too late. And we're playing catch up and it costs more money because the whole time we're trying to catch up, we're trying to dig for facts where if they would just go ahead and make the decision that they're no longer going to tolerate this uh, in their life and allow an attorney is, it, to create a game plan for success, that's when people have successful outcomes in the divorce. So some of the things that we see when someone may have a suspicion, they may come meet with us. Um, you might want to scoot over if that's good in your eyes. Sorry. That's not. I just didn't. <laughs> um, you have like a glowing forehead. Yeah. Um, but sometimes someone may have a suspicion. They'll come to us. Um, we'll kind of explain to them what the ramifications are. For whatever reason, um, you know, perhaps we did not um, communicate or educate them to the to, as much as we should have. Perhaps they go back and they they bury their head in the sand. They they don't want to acknowledge it. They want to pretend like it's not existing. It's not going on. And um, what 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 have you seen in those scenarios where there's um, you know perhaps the let's say Jane has an affair on John or had an affair and um, she's met with an attorney because she knows that the divorce is about to um, commence and John has suspicions he he also meets with an attorney but he decides he's just going to kind of ignore it and just see you know see what goes on see if, see see what can happen. If Jane has an attorney that's advising her to to do things knowing that a divorce is about to start, what what type of things do you typically see in that scenario? Like what what, what do you think Jane would be advised to do? Does Jane suspect John of having an affair? No, Jane had the affair. She knows that there's gonna be a divorce soon, that she's gonna file soon. Um, what what type of things do people do when they know they're about to file a divorce? that makes it difficult where you have to play catch up if you're representing the other party, the, the, the other party that was not aware of a divorce that was well, about to start. Well, in any case, um, preparation is key in all these things. I mean, um, in any divorce action, in litigation in general, um, typically the people that are most prepared and have the facts on their side are gonna have the best successful um, outcome at court. So typically what you'll start seeing is, uh, or at least what, you know, I suspect they would start seeing is they would start getting together bank records, start getting, you know, um, maybe there's a change in kind of their attitude and their position around the house. Maybe that, you know, she never cooked for the kids ever. Um, and, and then all of a sudden she's starting to cook. Maybe she's never, um, you know, never did the nighttime story. And now she's making sure she's done the nighttime story. Maybe she's never been there when the kids got off the bus. Um, and now she's starting to do that on a routine and, basis. And she's also posting it all over Facebook. So sure, and, and creating evidence to show that, you know, she's <clears throat> mom of the year. And, and it's vice versa. I'm just using Jane in this example. I mean, men do the same thing, um, you know. But I, I think it's important to note that um, that's when you, if you see those things, that's when you know possibly something's coming and you need to talk to counsel as well. But the court is only going to consider what happened from the time of filing back for the most part. Now, every instance is differently, but um, many times people come into court and say, well, I do all the stuff for school. I take them to every doctor's appointment. I do everything for the children. And then you show to the court that, well, that's actually not true. She may have started to do that. Jane, in this example, may have done it for the last two months. Um, but before that, here's what was really happening. And then we can prove that she was planning the divorce and it may come out in the testimony and everything like that. So you know, you'll, you'll see a change in behavior. That's what I see more than anything. People come in and they say, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, I think it's coming. She's doing X, Y, and Z. It's so different now. Her routines change. We all have routines. And if those routines change and you, you can see it's, it's making them look better, there's a reason they're doing that, unfortunately. What about hiding money? Have you ever seen that? Oh, sure. Um, I think one of the the hardest things in any situation is when people are hiding financial resources or moving assets. I mean, first of all, um, 
you know, this is just my opinion. This is not legal, but I can see this day in and day out. Some of the, the, the biggest things people have uh, fights about in divorce is kids and money. And quite honestly, when people have separate bank accounts, that's when you really got to be on the lookout because you have no way of knowing. Um, uh, unfortunately, we see a lot of divorce with people having separate bank accounts and, you know, they're complaining saying, well, I don't, I don't know where their money's going. I, well, you know, so, yeah, that, so when they have separate bank accounts, the only way you can find out that information is to file the action and get the subpoena power of the court. So that's where it makes it very difficult. I have cases before where the clients did not want to file the divorce action, but they needed to get the bank records. And so the only thing they could do is file the divorce and see if, you know, and, and that makes it a very difficult situation. Um, I think uh, one thing in it, it, just thinking practically, if you have concerns, you got to trust your gut. You got to ask the difficult questions. If they're not willing to give you access to their account, something's There's wrong. your answer. Yeah. So, you know, step one would be to have joint bank accounts throughout. I understand some people don't do that. They don't want it. That doesn't mean they can't give you access to your online banking. That doesn't mean they can't give you a copy of the statement. And if they're not willing to give you a copy of the statement, then that's a huge trust issue. That's not illegal. I'm not giving you legal advice. Just practically, that would be a huge uh, breach of trust in a marriage if you're not willing to even give a statement showing what you know, I, I, I'm surprised all the time at how many people don't even know how much their spouse makes. I mean, that's OK. That's their decision. I'm not judging them for that, but I can see where that can cause a huge problem in the marriage. There's no accountability in, in some of those situations. Right. So getting back to your additional questions on hiding money, it's virtually impossible to find out pre-divorce if anyone's doing anything with money if you don't have joint bank accounts. Because. I have no authority. I can't call the bank and just say, hey, I need John's Bank of America information. But if we file for divorce, I can send them a subpoena and they're going to produce it. And then we can go through it and we can hire a forensic accountant. And um, that's just the process of that. So step one, ask them to provide you information. Trust your gut. Trust your instinct. And if you think they're hiding something, ask them about it. And if they won't provide you the documents, then there's your answer. Mm -hmm. We see, I, I wanted to say too, we do see a lot of instances where um, there, one spouse will have credit cards that the other spouse doesn't know about. Um, you know, there, and when we talk about infidelity, it's not always just um, a sexual thing. I mean, there's other forms of infidelity, such as financial. Um, what have you seen, you know, what are some, what's a scenario that you've seen regarding, you know, someone maybe cheating financially? Well, what do you mean by cheating financially? Well, like like racking up debt that the other spouse is not aware of. Well, sure. I mean, there's a lot of times, a few points on that. So, um, yes, there may not be an actual affair, a sexual affair. There may be a financial, what we would label a financial, that's not a legal thing. But if they're uh, using money that's that's not known to the spouse, I mean, that, that's difficult as well. And I think that goes back more to trust than anything. Um, but they could be draining the marital estate. I mean, that's what we see a lot of times is that people get in financial trouble. They don't disclose it to the other party. And then next thing you know, an estate that was worth a million is down to 300,000 because they wanted to keep funding this business that they really enjoyed, but it was losing money hand over fist every year, every year. And again, if you don't stay on top of that, the court can only divide up what is left. Um, they can, you know, they can't retroactively go back and say, well, 500,000 that was wasted. Now you get it because they can only pull from the pot. I mean, theoretically, there's ways to get it, but um, it makes it very difficult for the court. So, um, you know, it's difficult. I understand in a marriage, uh, we look at it as divorce attorneys in here at our office as a business transaction. Uh, I like to tell everyone that's going through a divorce, you want to hire an attorney that wants to treat this as uh, a business A and B splitting up into business A and business B because a, a marriage, when you've been married 30 years, you've got children, retirement accounts, assets, uh, credit cards, debts, uh, you're dividing up a business and you've got to take the emotions away of that. So it's easy for us to say it's hard in practicality for a lot of these people to do because they see it in their everyday lives and you have to make a decision as to whether or not you're going to accept that anymore. And, and, and it's OK if you if you want to accept it. I, that, who am I to judge you for that? If you want to keep your family intact and that's something that you're willing to tolerate, I'm not going to sit there and ever tell you that that's a bad idea. But if you do make that decision and um, you're not willing to accept it anymore, and there is a brighter future out there for you and your family, um, then come talk to us.
What about the liability aspect? If one spouse accrues um, a lot of debt during the marriage is like, let's say John racks up 200 grand in credit card debt and you guys may scoff at that number, but it's, it's realistic. Um, what, is Jane on the hook for that? Well, it depends. It depends on a lot of fa factual situations. Technically, okay, so this is going back to this. The, the law says that it's equitable division of marital debts and assets. Um, what does that mean? If you ask um, anyone walking down the street, they'd probably tell you everyone gets 50-50. If, if John incurred $200,000 worth of unsecured credit card debt, then Jane's got to cover 100000 of it. Half, 50-50. Well, that's not entirely true. Generally, the person that may, the, the breadwinning spouse is going to be responsible for taking a responsibility of most of the debt. So if they both make an equal amount, let's say they both make $100,000 a year, then the judge may determine that it's, that debt should be divided up equally. I, if I was representing Jane, I would obviously argue that she had no knowledge of this. She didn't now. If, if there was, if there's a windfall for her, let's say she didn't know about it, but they got a new patio set, um, they redid their basement, and she was just put her head in the sand and just didn't want to ask where it came from. Well, then yes, she would more likely be on the hook for it if they made an equal amount. Um, but if he was taking trips she didn't know about and taking his friends to the Masters and taking his trips to uh, Biloxi and going to Las Vegas and spending it on all kinds of things that. Jane did not have any windfall from, then yes, she would have a very good argument that he would be responsible for it all, even if they did make an equal amount. So it's all very fact specific and you would have to just speak to counsel about what your facts are. And, and on top of that, who your judge is. I think um, the number one thing that we try to do here at our office is uh, know our judges, know their tendencies, know their histories, um, use our experience in front of them to be able to explain to you what we think they're going to do because every judge has a hot button. I've gone to enough meetings, I've spoken to enough judges to pretty much know each judge around this area what they're going to do on a specific issue. Now, I can't guarantee it, but I can tell you what their tendencies are. And, and that's the most important thing. And what our experience is in front of that judge. Right, because I know some judges that, infidelity in particular, I there are many judges um, that would say they've heard enough that it doesn't it doesn't affect them. It doesn't move the needle. Some judges. All right, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's we're All gonna right. get to that one. As far as the, I just want to clear one thing up. So if the court says, um, you know what, John John racked up all this debt. Jane is not responsible for it. He she had no knowledge of it. He's gonna have to pay off this debt. What does that do for the credit card company? Do they care that the court says that Jane's not? No. So if it's a joint debt, the creditors could care less. They're going to go after whoever. So generally what you've got to do is get, well, not what you have to do. It's not what you, you have to get the name off the debt. So there's two ways to do it. One is to literally open up a new card and get the credit transferred. Now the credit card company may not like that. So the court will put into place what's called an indemnification and hold harmless language, meaning that if they do not make those payments and the credit card company comes after you for the payment or whatever, that the opposing side, uh, John in this instance, uh, would be responsible to pay you back. Um, so, okay, so so even though that the credit card company may, may go after Jane for this debt, if John does not pay it off like he is supposed to, Jane can then take John to court. Would it go back in front of the family law judge as a contempt? Sure. So, so she could potentially take him back to court for contempt. So uh, in instance, uh, just typing, uh, talking in hypotheticals on what happens, um, you know, Jane is responsible, or excuse me, John is responsible for paying these credit card debts, um, and he fails to do so. He refuses to do it. And Jane is um, has a, some type of security clearance with her job that requires a credit score of above X number of number. And in order to keep her security clearance, she has to keep a credit score up. So when John doesn't pay, she has to make those payments in order to keep her credit score up in order to keep her job. She can then sue John and say, judge, he didn't do what he was supposed to do. He's in contempt and he did not, he has to hold me harmless. So he has to pay for my attorney's fees and he has to pay all the credit cards that I've had to pay back. And potentially if he is willfully in contempt, meaning he has the ability to make the money to pay the debt, the court can incarcerate, incarcerate him yeah. until he 
pays it or, or purges, makes a purge amount. Yeah, and generally that's, I mean, and generally specifically with debts, we try to do whatever we can to get the, the name out, you know, require them to take it out of the, uh, the other party's name. Uh, that That's, you know, it's very rare that you see uh, someone have that amount of debt and it not being able to re remove it somehow, whether it's take an asset and pay it off and then um, they have the debts reduced tremendously. Um, you don't, you don't really ever want a situation where the debt's going to remain in both parties' name afterwards. You want to have some sort of language, maybe give them six months, give them a year, anything to that you're comfortable with, but they have a deadline that they have to do it. If they don't do it, then they have to pay it off. So as much as possible, the court's trying to provide a clean break between the two, the two individuals. Yes. Well, Yes, as clean as that. They're going to give you a break. They're going to break it up. They're not going to let your names be tied. There's specifically with houses, you're going to have to refinance or sell. You know, credit card debts are a little bit different, um, but most of the time, you know, you can maneuver the assets of the marital estate to make sure that that's taken care of within a timely manner. Okay, so the next two things I want to talk to you about. First is what do judges really think about infidelity? How much? Um, in, in your opinion, how much does it matter to the judge? Um, if it does matter to the judge, what does it affect? And I'll, I'll get more specific with that. And um, That's a lot right there. All right, should we start there? That, that's okay. a lot. All right, that's we'll start there. All right, so first of all, what do, in your experience, what do judges, what weight do, does infidelity bear on a divorce case that a, that a judge might be sitting well sitting again it depends on your facts but I, I will have to say that um in an instance where that where an infidelity has the most impact on any case is when the non-breadwinning spouse the person whether it be let's say a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad I've represented both in, the, in the instances um where they or with the children primarily, and the other side is, you know, uh, taking care of all the finances, working, bringing home the paycheck. So the non-breadwinning spouse, if they have the affair, that is when it's a huge issue. Because if you can prove that, if the breadwinning spouse can prove that the non-breadwinning spouse had the affair, then they can bar alimony. Completely. Completely bar. That's based on the statute. If, if the affair by the non-breadwinning spouse, caused the divorce, caused the separation, and the court finds that that was the cause of the divorce, then that non-breadwinning spouse would then be barred from asking the court for alimony, any support, okay, mm -hmm. uh, from the breadwinning spouse. That's when it's a huge issue. So unfortunately, in the circumstances where the breadwinning spouse is having the affair, um, it doesn't have a huge impact. It, it, I mean, it, it does, but it, 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 there's, I mean, if you're talking about someone that is used to a lifestyle with their, uh, with a breadwinning spouse making three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars a year, and they are getting a divorce, and because of their affair, they're barred from getting any alimony, any support, they're left with what? Child support and whatever estate they have? That's a huge impact. Um, on the flip side, if the breadwinning spouse were to have an affair, there is still an impact, but it's just not as much. So generally what the courts can't punish someone uh, for having an affair, but generally what you see is a reallocation of the marital estate. So what they would say is instead of giving the 50-50 that you traditionally would think of, of the assets, uh, they may give 60-40 or they may give 75-25 or, you know, they, they would, you could see um, a reallocation of the marital estate where the non breadwinning winning spouse would get a little bit more. And because it's a sympathy argument at that point, um, you know, it, 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 there's no doubt that the non bread or the breadwinning spouse had the affair that caused the divorce. That's, I mean, that plays with the jury that plays with the judge. It plays with anyone. Um, but again, that goes back to knowing your judge because some judges, you know, as we talked about earlier, they just, it, it doesn't move the needle for them. So you have to know who's your audience, you know, is your audience a jury? Is your audience the judge? And if your audience is the judge, what, um, what is his or her feelings on that issue? So let's say Jane is a doctor and she makes $400,000 a year. And John is, he, he, he's a couch potato. He sits on the couch. He meddles around with little businesses that don't go anywhere that don't make any money. And um, Jane learns that John's been having an affair. And so she, she files for divorce, right? She comes to us, she, she hires us, 
And in this scenario, Jane is the breadwinner. John is the, um, the spouse that cheated. And she comes to us and she really wants to she really wants to allocate a lot of her legal re legal expense resources towards proving this affair. Okay. Um, so sometimes we may tell our you know potential clients, we, we we can do whatever you want if that is important to you and that's what you um, that's what you need to have this divorce be finalized and to move on with your life. You need him to admit or for, you know, maybe he was telling Jane that she was crazy. She was imagining things and she wants to just finalize it, that she wasn't crazy. She knew what was, you know, she had a suspicion and she was right. Um, we can certainly go that route, but we also want to explain to them that it may not have that much of an impact in the divorce because Jane is already the breadwinner, right? So, right. so, but if John's having the oh, affair. Sorry, yeah, no, I screwed it up. So, yeah, if John was having the affair, then it, that would bar him from alimony. So let me give that example. So if John was having the affair in that example, the non-breadwinner, Jane would want to uh, use her, her financial resources to prove that. So how would she do that? That's the question. She, you know, she's got to go to work. She can't sit around and, like, you know, see what he's doing on the couch and wait for his girlfriend to come in and take a picture of it. So, no. What do you do? You hire professionals. Um, and you hire professionals that will go out there and gather the evidence for you, private investigator, um, and you hire them through your attorney's office. That's the most important thing. Um, you want to. Just so really the firm. The firm hires a private investigator. Sure, you would want to have hire our office, and then we will hire a private investigator on your behalf, one that we trust, one that we work with, one that we know will, will get the job done. And not not only that, if they. If, if it's not true, then they'll let us know and not just waste your money. That's, uh, you know, that's why I work with people that I trust, that if, they, if they're not going to find anything, then they're going to let us know so we're not just wasting your money and you know, churning up fees. So another question I have is when we're talking about hiring a private investigator, do, do, does a divorce action have to be filed? Or like what if someone's just suspicious and they're like, I have this suspicion, but I, I don't want to file because if I'm wrong – I'm, right. You know. Well, I would 100%, and I can't stress this enough, um, hire the attorneys, hire our office, and let us hire a private investigator, and we will not file a divorce. Because um, if you file it, then you got to give them notice. If you get them served, then the cat's out of the bag. If you, I mean, what you want to do is gather your evidence. Going back to what I talked about earlier, the people that are most successful in any divorce action or litigation in general are the ones that are the most prepared. And so you want to be prepared and get your ducks in a row. So you hire our office and then we will get a private investigator to gather the evidence. And then once we get the evidence that we feel is sufficient, then we'll go ahead and file the action because the number one thing that's going to happen after you serve the, your spouse with divorce papers, they're going to change. Behavior is uh, going to change. Yes. Yeah, they will become the spouse of the year. They'll become dad or mom of the year. Uh, they will have, uh, they'll stop working late. They'll stop going out with their buddies. They'll be at home. They'll, if, if they, if they, if, if they, they care, if they, they care, right. <laughs> sometimes they don't care. If they don't, then, you know, the divorce is likely going to be easy because they'll just do what you want to do, which is great too. Um, but in a contested, contentious litigation, um, they, I, I mean, everything's going to change. So you have to make sure that you get your facts and your ducks in a row before you file, because as soon as you file, everything's going to be different. Okay. Now the big question, um, this is another big one that we get a lot. So when there is a spouse that is cheating and there are children born and born out of the marriage, what effect does that have on, well, first of all, I'm gonna, let me kind of give you a hint of where I'm going with it, but you know, tell me how to answer it. Before, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in some in instances, um, that would have zero bearing on the custody like who would get custody of the children, right? Just because like, let's say John's. John well, let me, let me answer your question. Let me just answer because I know where you're going. Okay, okay. so right. how does an infidelity affect the custody aspect of your divorce? Yes. Correct, okay. So it can't, generally it doesn't, okay? Judges will tell you all the time, hey, you may have been a bad spouse, but that doesn't mean you're a bad parent, okay? So someone can be a bad mom or, I'm mean, sorry, a bad wife or a bad husband, but a good mom or a good dad. Right. And so you have multiple options. Um, one, you can bifurcate the trial. Um, you can have a trial just on the parenting aspect of the case, and you can have a trial on the financial aspect of the case. Um, but in, in general, the only way an affair is going to affect 
uh, the custody is, let's say in your example, Jane is having an affair and what she is doing is choosing her adulterous relationship over her children. Let's say she doesn't go to the soccer games. Let's say she does not, instead of coming home and doing the homework with her children, um, she is saying that she's working, but we can prove that she's having an adulterous relationship. That has a tremendous, so it becomes, it's not, it's not only do they have to choose the affair over their spouse, right? Someone else over their own spouse, but they have to choose it over their children for it to affect the custody arrangement. And generally you'll know that generally, um, you know, if the other spouse is doing double duties because now all of a sudden she's working late all the time or something's going on and you're having to do everything, then yeah, that could have a tremendous impact. And that will come in again to your preparations because Again, if you file for divorce and let the cat out of the bag before you got your evidence, then, you know, your whole case could be up in flames. But that wouldn't necessarily, um, it wouldn't necessarily mean that they would lose custody, but no. just that they may not get primary because Correct. they've shown historically that they're choosing um, an adultery, an affair over spending time with their kids. So, like, their, their priorities have been made clear. Right. But generally, I mean, generally speaking, the uh, affair just generally doesn't have a big impact on the custody aspect of the case. Um, the only times you really see that is, again, an easy example is, you know, in, instead of going to their children's soccer games on Saturdays, they're going with their uh, going and having the affair. That That's when it is um, uh, very difficult to overcome in a custody aspect. Okay. And then another question, when we talk about infidelity, um, is it like what is it specifically? Is it fellatio? Is, like, is there is it specifically? What is it? A, if, what if they're having an emotional affair? When you're talking about infidelity as for the purposes of of, of a bar to alimony, what does that mean? You have to again. You have to prove sexual intercourse. Um, so, and again, I mean, the courts prove it through circumstantial evidence. I mean, you, so you're. It, so if you see um, John and Julie going into a hotel room together, there you go. And you have, you know, why else would they be going into the twenty nine ninety nine hotel or the Holiday Inn on a Saturday night when she told you she was going to work, or told when he told you she was going to work? Um, I mean, it's it's a reasonable inference for the court to say there's no other purpose for them to meet up at the hotel. Now, if there is a convention there and they're a part of that convention, that, that's where your facts could fail. Um, you know, you've got to know kind of your circumstances and you've got to get your facts in line to make sure that, uh, you know, everything lines up and it all makes sense. And, and generally it will, provided you do it the right way. It's, it's very hard to retroactively prove an affair occurred. You've got to do it before you start the litigation most of the time, unless it's just clear. I mean, and if it's clear, then it's not a big issue. It'll be resolved, but you can't, it's very difficult to manufacture evidence to prove an affair. You have to, you have to really, uh, a good, uh, good legal representation will have you start that prior to initiating any action to make sure that you can prove it. So, um, you know, go ahead. Well, and I just wanted to say uh, one thing about that as well. Now that we're on that topic, another big issue with the affair that comes up a lot is that if you can prove the affair that caused the divorce, then you can also get the um, you have grounds to ask the court for reimbursement of the marital estate that they spent. So let's say that you prove the affair because you had your private inv investigator find out that that when he was when he or she was going to Myrtle Beach for that work convention, oh, it really wasn't a work convention. It was a weekend with their um, having an affair. So you can state that if there was $150 every night for, I don't want to do math, $100 a night for four nights at a hotel, and they ate out for $100 a night, that's $800 total right there. Uh, you could say the court, he, he or she, whoever's having the affair, needs to reimburse the marital estate, and then you would get back. 400 of that 800 that they spent. Now it's normally not dollar for dollar. I don't want anyone to get that because you can, if it's been going on a while, it can total um, a, a very large amount, but the, the, you can, if you prove that the affair caused the divorce, you can ask for the um, party to reimburse the estate. And in turn, uh, you would get, you'd be subject to receiving a, a portion of that back. 
We do want to say, you know, there's a myriad of, of, of instances of um, people who are in a marriage where there is infidelity. And, um, you know, there's some people who they, they accept that and um, they are willing to tolerate that and they have children together and they're, they're, they're content with um, putting up with that problem or that thorn in their side. Um, and we're not here to, you know, break up marriages. Um, we're not here to pass judgment on someone who may choose to, to put themselves in that situation. Um, but we also want people to know that there is hope. There is a better life. Um, there is a life where you are meant to be prosperous and happy and appreciated and loved. And, you know, if you're seeing things like, um, they're very protective of their cell phone suddenly. So suddenly they'll, you know, passwords, passwords. They won't share any passwords to emails or they're changing their, you know, perhaps they used to have used to know their email password or their social media password. Um, they're getting super protective about their phone. Anytime you walk near their phone, maybe it's on the table, they'll snatch it up. Um, if you're seeing things like this, or if you, you know, like they're blatantly cheating, they're, um, they're, they're not even trying to hide it. And, you know, if you've not made the decision that, that that's what you want, that's your life and that's the life you want to live and, and, and that's, you know, what you want to do. If you have, if you have a, if you have a desire to have a better life than what you're experiencing right now, if you have a desire, if you have a belief, if you have a hope that you can find someone who really does love you, you can be in a faithful marriage, then we want you to come to us and we can talk to you. We can let you know how to prepare for what is coming. Um, divorce is not, it doesn't tickle. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. Um, even when it's, even when it's, um, by consent, even when both parties agree that it's time to move on and, um, and, and get out of a toxic relationship, it's still difficult. It's still the end of something that at one point in your life you thought was, was going to be beautiful and was going to last forever. And we understand that. Um, what we are trying to do is make sure that our clients are in their best position, that they have all of the information that they need. It's not that you're snooping. It's that you have the information that you're entitled to by law. Um, regarding bank accounts and finances. And that's what we're here to do is make sure that your legal rights are being protected and that we are getting you in a position where you're going to have a fair financial future after this divorce. You're not going to have to just um, hand over everything and, and have to start from scratch when perhaps you've, you've spent your whole life building up this marital estate. Um, so we're really here just to protect you and to make sure that your children have a great plan in place between you and your spouse, your ex-spouse, so that they, their best interest is always at the forefront. And, um, you know, one thing we also encourage our clients to, to not do is to use the children as pawns. You may be very hurt and upset that your, your partner cheated on you. And, and that is a very, that is a very deep pain. And, you may be tempted to try to alienate the children from them um, because you're so disgusted that they could do this. Just remember um, that these children, you know, depending on their age, they may not need to know everything right now. Um, in our experience, they eventually figure it out. Um, but you don't want to disparage the other, the other parent. Um, you, you do want to make sure that your children are still going to be and, you know, instead of in one unhappy home, they're in two happy homes. Um, what about, one other thing I want to ask you, Chris, before we end. What about, let's say, you know, um, John had an affair and um, Jane files for divorce. They're going through, they're going through divorce. And um, John decides he's, he's going to let his, his new girlfriend move in with him and they have children together. Um, what can the court do in, in, the, in that scenario? Like he's moving the so so they're during the divorce during the divorce. Well, you know, look as a practical matter, I tell my clients all the time: the worst decision you can ever make during a divorce is to move on and to initiate another family. I mean, one, it's it's practically difficult for um, the children in and of itself. Uh, I, I would say that that I think a judge would look at that as you making a selfish decision. Um, but you know, every situation is different. Um, so I think you've got to, again, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Um, you've got to make decisions that one, here's, here's basically what I tell all my clients. 
Because at the end of the day, it's about making decisions in life or in this case, in this custody case. And you've got to make every decision you make, whether it's a decision to text your ex-spouse something or a decision to send that email or a decision to make that phone call um, and express your opinion about something, you have to be able to stand up in front of the judge and and really articulate why you made that decision and why it was important to you. And if you don't feel comfortable telling the judge that, there you go. There's your sign. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't send that text. Don't make that phone call. Don't send that email. Because it's all coming. If, if, don't if, make that if, Facebook post. If, you ha if, if your self hires us, it's all coming in. We're getting right. in. I mean, the, the, the crazy thing about social media is it's changed the game in litigation. I mean, we, you know, before, well, let me say we get laughed at because we share a Facebook page and you know, everyone's like, which one of you cheated? And the reality is when you're in this profession and you see, you know, nobody expects divorce, nobody, you know, walks down the aisle thinking I can't wait to divorce this one. You know, this is, this is my future ex. No, I mean, you, you get married and you, you believe that you hope it's going to last forever. Nobody, you know, goes into a marriage expecting, or they, I hope they don't, if they did, that'd be sick, but, um, you know, expecting or, or wishing for a divorce. So when you see what is introduced in evidence as a divorce attorney through Facebook. Um, yeah. And so, you know, Sarah and I get piggybacking on that, just some practical advice on, on marriage. I mean, we're not marriage counselors by any means, but we've made decisions in our relationship based on having a divorce firm. Uh, we share a Facebook account. Why? Why? Well, I mean, you know, we eliminate that one thing that could possibly go wrong. Why do it? Why, why? I mean, think about social media in general. What, what do you have it there for? Well, you have it there for to keep up with friends, to see what everything's going on. Uh, but in the divorce world, what does it do? It's, it allows people to get in touch with their old high school fling or contact their college sweetheart. Or so in, it, you know, if you have, if you have separate accounts, that's fine. I'm not saying that you can't do it, but we made the decision just to eliminate that. Let's just share an account. That way, if someone wants to be a friend, then we can both see it, right? Uh, same thing with bank accounts. We've talked about that earlier. I mean, one way to eliminate uh, issues with finances uh, and concerns about how you're going to be financially st stable is to have joint bank accounts. But again, if you if you make a decision to do uh, otherwise, that's passwords, between you. Passwords, you know. Um, share passwords. Share passwords. She knows my email password. She can get into everything. One, it's great because I don't have to tell her all the time. <laughs> but two, it's I, I know hers, and it's it's you know it's just in you know. It's also accountability, and right. I think especially with social media, when every when the world sees that you share a page with your husband, there's you know your ex boyfriend's not gonna write, hey, I've been missing you. You know they 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 understand that there's. You know, there's no secrecy to it. So people aren't going to be causing temptations in the marriage either, um, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, and so in, in any situation when you're going through a divorce, whether it started or whether you think it's coming up, I, I think the ultimate thing is you have to be accountable for your own decisions. You have to be accountable for what you're doing because it's a very fact-based driven case. So like their text messages are coming in. Every text message Your you send phone for the calls are coming in. That, uh, we litigate every single day and it's basically we're getting a bunch of screenshots of text messages. Um, so when you call her a piece of you know what mom, that's going to be like exhibit number one. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when you say that you're not going to pay her any child support because she doesn't deserve it, that's exhibit number two. And when she says, you're never going to see your child because you didn't pay me anything, that's exhibit number three. So, I mean, like all this is coming in and you just, it's easy for us to say, hard for you to do. I get it. We all say things out of anger, uh, but people have got to understand, especially when it gets close and you're, especially when you're going through it. Right. I mean, come on. It is shocking. I mean, it is shocking what, what people write when they, hopefully they've been told by their attorneys. That's all evidence. That's all coming in. That's all going to be used against you. Right. And it's hard, you know, especially I think with text messages, when you say something, it may come across one way, but if you email it or text it, it can look really bad. Um, you know, sarcasm does not play well with text messages or emails. Um, and you just come off looking like a jerk. And you know, if you're not a jerk, then, then that's not a good position for you. If you want to come off looking like a jerk, well then there you go. But it's um it's quite interesting to see what people are willing to put out there um, on social media that you know they must and I have to think they must be unaware that that it's going to be used against them as yeah. evidence. 
So um, if you are in interested, if you are, you know, you just need a little more information, we have some options here at Hobson and Hobson PC. Um, you can call us at 770-425-3373. Again, that's 770-425-3373. 3373. If you're not comfortable with making a phone call, you can also reach us by email. We have an intake form on our website at www.hobsonlegal.com. That's www.hob as in boy, S O N, legal.com. Um, and that's a great way to communicate. If you prefer to communicate by email, just let us know. Um, typically, if we get an email through the website, someone from our office will be calling you. We have a great team here. Um, we have Beth, who's kind of like the client concierge, and um, a great staff of four attorneys and a paralegal. Um, so you let us know what works best for you for communication. We also, you know, if you run a business or you're a doctor or um, a professional, we can also travel to you. We, have, we do have a concierge service for people who would prefer to spend as little time um, outside of their office as possible, we can make that happen. And, or if you may be uncomfortable with coming to an attorney's office, we can offer um, outside meeting places as well. So I hope you all enjoyed this. And if you have any suggestions for future topics, please comment in, on, on the um, this feed below. And thank you. Absolutely. He had zero preparation. So um, good job. You did good. Thank you. We'll <laughs> see you next week.